Joining us now, we have the founder of The Daily Poster, the one and only David Sirota. Great to see you, sir. Good to see you, David. Good to see you. Good to see you. Um, to start with, we were taking a look at your most recent piece at The Daily Poster about these uh, corporate Democrats who have just completely collapsed when it comes to uh, drug price negotiations. Of course, this is something that Democrats have run on for literally more than a decade. Um, it's something that even really super annoying, moderate corporate Democrats like Kirsten Cinema ran on, promising to lower prescription drug prices. It polls at somewhere around 90%. Literally everyone supports it, except it seems for these obnoxious people and every Republican who also wouldn't back it. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. You basically nailed it, uh, except you've got three uh, House Democrats who voted to uh, try to kill it. And those three House Democrats took a whole lot of money from the pharmaceutical industry and are now facing really angry constituents. Um, the the response and the, the justification that they're offering to their constituents is actually quite revealing, especially uh, Congressman Scott Peters from the San Diego area, who represents a very safe Democratic district. He was asked, he's the number one uh, recipient of pharmaceutical money in the entire United States House of Representatives in this election cycle, and his constituents are mad that he voted this way. And they asked him why he did this and can he please stop taking so much pharmaceutical money? And he said no, uh, because he does not want to, quote, unilaterally disarm. Uh, and to not take the money would mean, quote, it would be like, uh, quote, defunding my campaign, which is really revealing, isn't it? Because it really kind of says he can't even imagine running a campaign, raising money in a grassroots way for a campaign uh, without giant money from the pharmaceutical industry. I mean, it really is a window into how some of these lawmakers see the world and have and how they built their political uh, uh, their political careers. I mean, he is basically admitting he could not uh, have the resources to run a campaign unless he raked in all of that pharmaceutical money. So, David, I mean, let's switch gears entirely to the entire reconciliation bill. Let's put this up there on the screen. Cinema making some comments there about what exactly she says that if the House delays its scheduled September 27th vote on the bipartisan infrastructure plan, or if that vote fails, she will not back the reconciliation bill. How serious are we to look at this? And if that's the case, David, doesn't this effectively mean the entire legislation is going down? And why is she doing this? I mean, I think if you believe that she will follow through on that, uh, then then you're right. Then the entire reconciliation bill, which let's be clear that reconciliation bill is a, is a technical term. That's the entire Democratic Party agenda, the promises that were made in the 2020 campaign. And before that, that's basically done because it is a 50-50 Senate where any one senator, if they join with the Republicans to kill uh, the reconciliation bill, that means it's over. Uh, so this is a game of chicken. And and you've got the House progressives who, uh, 16 at least, uh, who have been on record saying we're not going to vote for the bipartisan business-backed infrastructure bill unless it remains linked to the uh, reconciliation bill. Uh, now, you can ask, well, why would cinema and people and someone like Joe Manchin threaten to kill the reconciliation bill? Well, we have a story coming out very soon uh, about part of the reason uh, that may be at work with Kirsten Cinema when it comes uh, to uh, prescription drug prices and the pharmaceutical industry. But more broadly, uh, you've seen this opposition be announced by these corporate Democrats almost immediately after there was a big Washington Post story about this, almost immediately after uh, the collective power of corporate America began lobbying aggressively, an aggressive campaign to kill the reconciliation bill. So it, uh, to my mind, it goes back to when money says jump, corporate Democrats say how high. And they're willing to do that even if it means destroying their own party's uh, promised agenda. So the bet from progressives and also from Pelosi, um, who's been an unusual ally in some of this, uh, at least to a certain extent, was that uh, these corporate Democrats like Cinema and Manchin et al. care so much about this bipartisan infrastructure deal that they won't blow that up. Um, and if progressives credibly threaten, as they have, to withhold their votes from that bipartisan infrastructure deal, causing it to tank, that that would be real leverage, that would be real power. Do you think they miscalculated here? I mean, do you think that Manchin and Cinema and these other people, do they really care that much 
about this bipartisan infrastructure deal such that that constitutes real leverage in the negotiations? I think they do. And and I think that, but I, I would put it this way. I think they're banking on House progressives simply backing down. Because let's be honest, that's what House progressives have done uh, forever and ever in situations like this, in standoffs like this. Now, it is my view that you could have the bipartisan infrastructure bill be voted down. You could have the reconciliation bill uh, initially be voted down. But as I've said before, that does not preclude them bringing those bills right back up. I mean, that can happen. We've seen that happen in the past. So I think this game, this standoff, this game of chicken may continue for a couple of iterations. And I think you're going to see that uh, uh, Manchin and Cinema are going to try to rely on House progressives ultimately blinking, ultimately folding. And I think Nancy Pelosi is banking on the reconciliation bill being watered down into nothing so that she can say to Manchin and Cinema, look, I basically gutted the bill you didn't want. Then she can go to the House progressives and say, hey, listen, I kept a reconciliation bill, regardless of what's in it, just something called a reconciliation bill. I kept that linked to the infrastructure bill and we're passing that. The problem there, of course, is that if you got the infrastructure, uh, excuse me, the reconciliation bill, uh, that's that's what actually matters. Not not a bill just called a reconciliation bill, but what's actually in the reconciliation bill. And what we've reported on before is that the House progressives have not stated exactly what they want in the reconciliation bill. They've not been clear about what their deal breakers are. They've not said this, this, this must be in the reconciliation bill. They've only said they want a robust reconciliation bill. So I think that's where we're actually moving, where mm-hmm. that idea of robust becomes the place where the negotiation really happen, and frankly, where the the bad stuff will happen, where the stuff will get cut out of it that needs to be in there. Let's talk about this politically. You know, it's interesting, David. Increasingly, I am just reminded of Obamacare, which is that it started out as something where, you know, Obama seemed to have the political high ground. Then as things dragged on and people got involved, nobody could actually understand exactly what was in the bill. And it became an overall net win for Republicans because they could attack the idea. Is that kind of what you see happening here, especially if there are middling results within the bill itself? Look, I I think what the Obama, the early Obama era taught was that if you do not deliver quickly material gains to people, uh, to regular people, that they can understand that. And if you do not deliver it in a robust, a real way, that you become, as the majority party, vulnerable to attacks by Republicans. That's a basic broad stroke uh, story of what happened in the early Obama years. Uh, And I think that's the danger here, is that if you do not pass a big enough bill, Uh, with enough uh, direct aid that the average voter can understand and can feel in their lives, then you run the risk of of having it be attacked, Uh, not just attacked, because it will be attacked, but but have those attacks be effective. Have the Republicans run around saying, see, they promised you all these things and they didn't deliver. It is my view that you have to deliver to make the case that you fulfilled your promise and that you are materially improving people's lives. A gutted reconciliation bill uh, a an infrastructure bill uh, and only an infrastructure bill that includes projects that that we know are slowly financed that the direct benefits uh, uh, take some time. I mean, the whole idea of shovel ready. Oftentimes, infrastructure bills take a long time to spend that money. So, if you get a gutted reconciliation bill on things that are easy to understand and only an infrastructure bill, then the Democrats are going to be left campaigning, saying, "Hey, we delivered for you," and the Republicans are going to be saying to the public, do you even realize you don't see those benefits, do you? Right. And it'll be a dishonest argument. But again, the point is you have to deliver in order to be able to campaign and say you have materially improved people's lives. The Obama administration early on was not really able to make that case. And they got, as Obama said, shellacked in the 2010 elections. That's the situation we may be in right now. Yeah, I think this is an important sort of like political, um, theoretical divide, because I think because members of Congress are here in Washington and they're very fixated on the process and they're very fixated on like what pundits are saying on Fox News about them or whatever, they think that what people are going to judge them by is whether they liked this particular process or not and whether they gave Republicans a talking point around spending or not. What you're saying is that what really matters is if voters are going to the polls and feeling like, hey, you know what? Delta variant's under control. I got a job. I feel like things are moving forward. I got a little more money in my bank account. 
and they don't really care about whether it required getting rid of the filibuster or overruling the Senate parliamentarian or whatever tactics you have to use to get there. They care more about the end result. That certainly seemed to be the lesson of the Obama era. And at times, the Biden administration has seemed to have taken in that lesson. But this whole situation with deferring to the parliamentarian, not being willing to get rid of the filibuster, separating the infrastructure bill and the rest of it in this con convoluted process that has dragged everything out and kept immediate relief from reaching Americans has really created a major issue for them because, again, people don't care about process. They care about did you deliver or did you not deliver? Especially when you're the majority party, correct. I, I would totally agree with you that if you're in the minority party, the process, uh, tying something up in the process uh, arguably helps serve your political goals. If yes. you're the majority party, the voters want to see that you are actually delivering things, that you are, quote, getting things done. And those are going to be the questions at the end of the day. Now, look, there's going to be a lot of misinformation, a lot of, you know, campaigns are rough and tumble. There'll be a lot of stuff thrown at Democrats if they, even if they deliver the best possible set of bills. That's inevitable. But as the majority party, the best chance you have to actually win re-election, uh, to, to be given more years in power, is to say, look at what we've actually delivered. And I agree with you that the parliamentarian, the filibuster, all of the, the worshiping of norms that, that Democratic leaders are going out there and trying to justify inaction, none of that will matter at the end of the day if they did not deliver material gains for regular people. So, David, you seem to be indicating here that you think, you know, there's this September 27th deadline for the infrastructure bill. You seem to think that both infrastructure and reconciliation may go down in the short term. And then there may be another round of haggling and negotiations where, you know, probably something sort of paltry and inadequate gets offered on the reconciliation side. A lot of pressure is brought to bear on progressives to like, listen, you guys got to go along with this and you don't want to keep, you know, bread out of the mouths of hungry children or whatever it is they use to shame progressives into compliance. That seems to be where you sort of think things are ultimately headed. Yes, that's what I think is going to happen. And I think the, that, that Pelosi and, and Schumer will rely on the idea that the public doesn't really understand the difference between, let's say, a three and a half trillion dollar reconciliation bill and a five hundred billion dollar reconciliation bill. Of course, there is a huge amount of difference that that will mean on the idea that we just talked about of actually delivering material gains for people. But I think in the short term, they'll say, well, you know, people will see that we passed something called a reconciliation bill that has some climate stuff in it. It doesn't matter how much we're actually spending. It doesn't matter how much we're actually doing. We can say we passed something. Now, I think something is probably better than nothing. But, the, but again, to go back to that fundamental principle, if you're not delivering real gains that people can feel in their lives, every dollar that you're not delivering of those real gains, you are increasing the risk to yourselves as the majority party uh, in the upcoming elections. Yeah. yeah. Well, Pelosi's not a person who cares about the actual reality of people's lives. She cares about a talking point. Which is why, as you said, for her, three and a half trillion, two trillion, one trillion, eight hundred billion, whatever it is, if she's got that talking point of we did the thing, that's really all that she's ultimately after here. And that's where the divide between her and the progressives is going to become very clear. Um, David, thank you as always. Guys, go and subscribe to The Daily Poster. They are constantly doing phenomenal work uh, highlighting and uncovering stories that no one else is paying attention to. David, thank you so much for your time this morning. Thanks, David. We'll have a link down there in the description. Thank you. Thanks to both of you. Mm -hmm. Our pleasure. Thank you guys so much for watching. We really appreciate it. You know, we've been trying to hammer this home, but we have been very much at the mercy of uh, the YouTube gods in terms of demonetization. They have not been kind, and more. They have not been <laughs> kind, um, largely because we've been covering this thing called the news, like 9-11, mm -hmm. Me Too, Jeffrey Epstein. It's really interesting, Crystal, how some of the most consequential stories that we have to cover are, quote unquote, not suitable for advertisers, which makes it what? Impossible to actually do the news on YouTube. The only way, and as we've said, we literally, if it were just YouTube revenue, we'd be dead, couldn't pay the bills yep. um, in order to keep the lights on here. So 
Link is down there in the description if you can help support us, become a premium member. We offer the benefits an hour early, AMAs, all that other stuff, but really what it's all about is being able to make sure we bring you exactly the show that we think is the most important. Oh, I've realized we covered abortion today. There, you know, money on the table. Yeah, but exactly. we gotta do it. I mean, I was, what are we supposed to do? I was thinking, I didn't yeah. even check. And this tells you how little this factors into our yeah. thinking. I didn't even check whether my Haitian migrant crisis I'll monologue yeah. yesterday yeah. It was potentially demonetized, yeah. but... Anyway, that kind of proves the point right. that we're aware that we're getting hit pretty hard with demonetization for covering the news, uh -huh. but um, it doesn't impact our thinking, it doesn't change what we're doing because of the support that you guys have shown to us. So um, thank you guys for that. Yes. We're extremely grateful. Have a great day, and we'll see you back here. See you. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching. That's right. Just as a reminder, you can become a premium subscriber today. Watch the full show completely uncut. Our reactions to each other's monologues. You get to listen to it. You get to ask us questions. All that good stuff. Link is right there in the description or at breakingpoints.com. Best of all, great way to say screw you to the mainstream media.